international speakers. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay, people. Hello. Hi. Can I can I request um, can I request ultra silence, like silence plus plus. Okay, I'd like to say just a few words to explain something about what's happening this evening. And for the next hour, everything that you see on the screen is, get, is being broadcast live through our website. So it's being watched by an international audience. So um, for the speakers that I'm about to welcome, you will soon be live on television. Please do not swear. And... Um, I'd just like to say that on Friday I spoke to a guy called Scott Chisholm, who Sinead will know, who has a project called Collateral Damage, which is a photographic portrait study of people who've lost family members or friends to suicide. So Scott, in Canada, um, drew an analogy between suicide prevention and cancer prevention, and he said that 30 years ago, no one talked about testicular cancer. It, it was stigmatised, it was taboo, you just didn't hear it. And 30 years later, that's something that we're quite comfortable to discuss. And he says the same thing needs to happen with suicide prevention. And that it's not until artists come on board to support a cause that it attracts the power and the voice that it needs to have to smash down that stigma and bring it into the public eye. So tonight it seems very fitting that the three speakers who we are about to see are all artists and I think that each of them will speak to that. So um, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Roy Henry Vickers, Kate Bornstein, and Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome Roy, Sinead, and Kate. Um, Roy, we'd like to hear from you first. Um, I'm going to hand over to you and ask you to introduce yourself in whatever way seems fitting. But first, uh, how has your day been so far? Well, my day has been exciting so far. I've never ever had the opportunity to Skype to three different countries at the same time. And uh, yes, it's been exciting. Fantastic. Um, so, Roy, could you introduce yourself to a global audience in whatever way seems fitting to you? Okay. Well, first of all, before I introduce myself, I want to do something that I feel very necessary. You can all join me with me if you like. Uh, I look to the East, the way of the teacher, and I give thanks for that great ball of fire that rises each day, and I ask for my eyes and my ears and my heart to be open to the lessons of the teacher, for without the lessons I'm an empty vessel. I look to the south, the way of the healer, and I think of our Mother Earth, and as I walk on her, I ask that my healing journey be ever present in my heart. I look to the west, where the sun goes down, and here on the West Coast, when the sun goes down, darkness comes to the world. And I think of the vision that the creator of all gave me, and I'm thankful for that vision. And I ask that the lessons of the teacher and the healing of the healer give me a clear vision as I look to the north, the way of the warrior, the way of the leader. And I ask for the strength to stand in the truth and the beauty of who I am and my lineage. So I was born here in British Columbia to a mother whose parents emigrated from England, a grandfather from Birmingham, and a grandmother from Scarborough. My father's lineage is Haida, Simshan, and Helsu. So I am Haida, Simshan, Helsu, and Canadian English. So, so that makes me a pretty well bit Canuck. Indeed. I'm a visionary, uh, an artist, a father, a husband. 
husband, and I guess a public speaker and definitely an environmentalist. My heart is uh, for our Mother Earth and all we can do to protect her as a, as a group of people. So that's my introduction. Thank you, Roy. And I think a lot of us are curious, what made you say yes to doing this event when you were asked? 20 years ago, I was faced with the lie that um, my life is not worth living and I should bring it to an end. Fortunately, I was taught that the Creator gave us our life and we don't have the right to take it ourselves. And so I live with an effort to be the best person I can and to share the love I have of life with the world around me. Thank you, Roy. Um, could you say a bit more about what communities you feel that you are a part of? Well, one of my teachers, um, a woman by the name of Angelise Arian, who wrote a book called The Fourfold Way, um, she articulated the fact that you are the center of your family, and your family is the center of your community, and your community is the center of your country, and your country is the center of the world. And so, with that in mind, I would say that I'm part of the community of the world. Um, I'm also a part of the First Nations communities of the world, the indigenous peoples of the world. I'm part of the Haida, Simshan, and Hailstead communities on the west coast of Canada. I'm part of the artistic community. I'm part of the community of teachers, the community of healers, the community of visionaries, and the community of leaders. And it gives me great pleasure to see that I'm part of them all today in a wonderful way here on Skype. Thank you very much, Roy. So now we know a little bit about the communities that you belong to. Could you tell us something of the problem of suicide in those communities? Oh, this is so dear to my heart. I, I deal in a big way with the First Nations communities of the area in which I live because they're the closest to me and uh, I see a growing number of people bringing it into their lives uh, in the of suicide. And it brings me to the tears. It brings me to the question, how have we lost our way as human beings with all of the technology, with the ability to, to do what we're doing here? How have we lost our spirit as a, as a human family? Mm -hmm. and when I look at First Nations communities especially, I think the words of a, another friend and teacher of mine, um, Gabor Mate, he said that to think of himself as a Jewish doctor, so consider the voice that is speaking, the fact that the First Nations of North America have faced a genocide much more thorough than the Jews. And it was a shock to me, but then he qualified it by saying, first of all, we had in one stroke of the pen our thousands of year matrilineal descent and matrilineal culture wiped out. And then we were taken from our families and put into residential schools and we suffered physical, mental, intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm number of generations. I'm part of a group of people of generation who would speak of that we were speaking earlier of how there's things that don't and how are how are the young to know what the problems are, what why we behave as 
elders and adults if we don't rush them. And as far as I know, the story of your story is the story you have to share with the world, and you must do it with the world. Thank you, Roy. Uh, Liam, uh, one of our techie ninjas, has asked if you could speak a little closer to your microphone, uh, but otherwise we're receiving you loud and clear. So... I'm, I'm, I'm a little closer there. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Roy, we're actually quite sweaty here tonight, although not not technically in a lodge, or is that just me? <laughs> okay. Um, Roy, we're about to um, hand over to Kate, but 
I'd like to thank you for your message about spirituality being um, a large part of hope for suicide prevention in your community. And I wonder if you have a message of support for Suicide Safe for Brighton. Oh, I certainly do. Um, first of all, we suffer from the violence of physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and sexual abuse in our communities. Um, the answer to dealing with the abuse is to find those who will share love with you, who will share information with you. And the Creator gave us life. And if we come back to a place where we knew the Creator as children, that will carry us. It will give us the hope we need. When all else fails in life, the hope that I find is that the Creator is always there to help me in my spirit and in my life and in my mind. And so when I ask, it's given. So Brighton, just ask for the truth of who you are to be revealed, and it will be. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. And thank you from our audience here. Okay, so it now gives me enormous pleasure to say thank you and goodbye for now to Roy and hello to Kate. Hello, Kate. Hello. <laughs> Woo, hooray. Hi, Kate. Um, so, Kate, uh, how has your day been so far? Well, I've been working. Um, I go around giving lectures uh, and I'm working on a new lecture called how to achieve world peace through gender anarchy and sex positivity. So I'm working on the slideshow that goes with that. Of course you are. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. So I guess for that might it might be helpful um, if you could introduce yourself to the audience <laughs> following that bombshell. <laughs> so go for it. Okay. My name is Kate Bornstein or Bornstein. It really doesn't matter. Um, I'm an author, a performance artist, I'm a playwright, um, I'm not an activist. People call me an activist. Oh, sorry. I think of myself as an artist in service to activism. Because um, I always screw up activism when I try to do it, unless I'm like licking envelopes or marching or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up and I'm a Jewish boy in New Jersey. Uh, I lived my life as a man all the way to the Church of Scientology, which is a lot more embarrassing than saying I am transsexual. <laughs> <laughs> I left Scientology and kind of fumbled around for, oh golly, another four or five years until I went through a gender change and became a woman! <laughs> and I never realized it wasn't a woman either. And I wrote a book about being not a man, not a woman. And that made some people happy and some people angry. And I keep talking about that stuff. Thank you. And we're glad that you do, Kate. So, um, it was beyond my wildest dreams that any of you might accept our invitation to take part in tonight's event. What was it for you that made you want to be part of this? Oh, and I should, Kate, is that a real cigarette you're smoking? This, no, this, this is an e-cigarette. Um, see, it has a little wire on it. It's attached to a USB cable on my, on my computer. It's my nicotine delivery system. Uh, I'm waiting for them to put marijuana in it. <laughs> <laughs> what was your question? No, I, <laughs> I can't quite remember. Now, hang on. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's my it's my job to be responsible for health and safety for grassroots, <laughs> which is why I felt I had to ask. But the question was, <laughs> the question was. What, what made you say yes to, to doing this, Kate? Because you're the kind of an activist I want to support with my art. You're doing the kind of activism with grassroots 
that blows me away. You're getting a whole town together to make it safer for teens and freaks and other outlaws so they don't feel like, I've, I've been suicidal six times in my life that I can remember. There's a lot I don't remember, but I can remember six times I was suicidal. And uh, I can be snarky about it now, but it's nothing to be snarky about. And the work you're doing, as soon as you say, ask me, yeah, duh, sure. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, spontaneous applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So um, I think we understand a little bit about some communities that maybe you don't feel part of. What communities do you identify with or feel that you belong to? Uh, man. <laughs> All right, let's, let's see. Um, I identify with the trans community. Uh, within that community, I identify as a trans woman. I'm a dyke, but not a lesbian. <laughs> um, I'm a tattooed lady, so tattooed people are my people. What, do you, what would you like to say about the problem of suicide in the community of freaks, outlaws, queers, however you want to put it? Right now, the culture is being led um, by trying to do that, but it's being led by big bullies. Um, Kate, hold on just a second. We're struggling to hear you just at the moment. Uh, if you could maybe be a bit closer to your mic, that might solve it. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping for a nostril shot from someone tonight. <laughs> Back to you, Kate. And All right. Um, what I think is we're under the thumb of a culture that is more increasingly being run by American fundamentalist bullies. Um, <coughs> they're coming to power with threat of, you're going to hell, because you're so bad. And when you, when you mess with someone's spiritual ideology to that degree, when you threaten someone with hell, uh, from a tiny, 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 itty, itty age, um, you mess that person up for life. Mm. Um, so I encourage my people to find spirituality in ways that don't threaten to get you sent to hell, um, mm. no matter what anybody says. And I think the only thing that can really get you sent to hell, if indeed there is a hell, is being mean to other people. So I tell anyone who listens to me that they can do whatever they want, you can do whatever you want to
to make your life more worth living. Period. Full stop. Anything. Unethical. Immoral. Illegal. Self-destructive. It doesn't matter. Do whatever you have to do to make your life more worth living. Just don't be mean. <laughs> you yourself faster than anything else. Thank you, Kate. Um, yeah. I think we can take that as a moral imperative from Kate Bornstein to Brighton and Hove, don't be mean. <laughs> Thank you. So, Kate, um, what would you like to see happening in your communities in terms of suicide prevention? I, I, I'd like you to um, put together the manual of what you're doing so it can be exported over to my country, which is really backwards compared to what you're doing there. Well, we actually got what we do from Roy's country, so... <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we can arrange for that, no problem. And anything else? There's, there's, there, there used to be a, 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 an AIDS activism called ACT UP, and their slogan was silence equals death. Yes. And this gets back to what you started us off with, saying that no one used to talk about testicular cancer. Mm. Let alone, that's nothing I talk about these days anyway. Um, <laughs> no one's talking about suicide. It's... Just the other day, an article came out from Haaretz, which is an Israeli newspaper, and they're on their online edition, they found out that um, Israeli citizens, youth, were attempting suicide as much as five times more than the hospitals and clinics were reporting. Yeah. Uh, the score of reporting, it was, it was a shameful thing, so they didn't report it. And this is both Jews and Arabs, Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Muslims. Um, because living in that kind of a fundamentalist world, where you're either or, you have, you're good or you're bad, that kind of belief that there's an absolute good and an absolute bad, ouch, um, so I encourage everyone to speak up, not be silent. Say when, you know, I'm not totally good. I'm not. Me, I am not. But I'm trying, and I'm trying not to be mean. And that's the kind of a value that allows anybody to make themselves a life more worth living. That's how I felt myself. Mm -hmm. Um, Kate, you said that there have been six times in your life that you remember when you've thought about killing yourself. And I wonder if you could tell us what it is that keeps you here, where hope comes from for you when things seem desperate. I, I, hope is something... I, I had that when Obama ran for president the first time. I'm, I'm trying to rekindle that now that he's running again in my country a second time. But hope isn't something I have easy access to. So what I found is the only person that can keep me from killing myself is me and people I trust. So I try to allow myself to trust people. That, that helps because let's say now all of a sudden, Chris, I trust you. Um, I'll listen to you if you tell me, you know, okay, maybe there's something I could do besides killing. Okay. And that's the question. I don't think suicide prevention is as much possible as offering people alternatives to suicide. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Who wants to kill them? But we can offer them better things to do. And that's what I try to do in my life. Thank you. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, Kate did write a book with, I think, the, my favourite title ever of a book. It's called Hello, Cruel World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks and Other Outlaws. Uh, it's really good. And you can there's an app for it on uh, iPhones and you can get a free download of it and so on and so forth. So thank you, Kate, for bringing that to us. Um, before we hand over to Sinead, uh, Kate, do you have a message for the good people of Brighton and Hove as we endeavour to become a suicide safer city? 
other than don't be mean. <laughs> Which is very good advice. <laughs> oh, golly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, there's no right way to live your life. I'm old, very old, 64 years old. And so I've, and I've walked on a whole lot of roads. And I found that all roads in life lead nowhere. <laughs> well, take the road that has the most heart and is the most fun. Fun's a big part. And um, anyone who wants to can go on my blog and download a Get Out of Hell free card. Because huh. you get one of those, and here's the deal you do whatever it takes to make your life more worth living. Anything at all. No, immoral, great, great at man for seven of them. Um, but just don't be mean. And if what you do to make your life more worth living, and you're not mean, guess you ended up in hell, hang on to the cart and give it to Satan, and I will do your time for you. <laughs> wow. Hey. <laughs> Only 64, that's unbelievable. Now, <laughs> live long and prosper, Kate. Um, well, I, I imagine a get out of hell free card is more than any of you were expecting tonight. So from one uh, sort of amazing privilege to yet another, it gives me huge pleasure to welcome Sinead. Hello, Sinead. Um, Hi, sorry, I couldn't hear a thing there. I'm up to be the nostril person. <laughs> 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 that was really good. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sinead. And so that's also an electronic cigarette, is it? Yes. <laughs> Marvellous. Okay. So, Sinead, how's your, how's your day been so far? It's been great, very good, thanks. It's a great privilege to be involved in science proceedings, so yeah. Wonderful. Hey. And um, I sent you a tweet maybe five or six months ago saying, Hi, I'm with Grassroots at Suicide Prevention. Do you fancy doing this video conference thing? And within five minutes, there was a little message saying, Sure. Um, what made you say yes? Uh, well, uh, I guess I feel, you know, God didn't make more than one of us for nothing, and uh, I suppose I like people, and uh, yeah, I guess it's also a, a place I've been myself, uh, so it would be a, a personal concern of mine, I suppose. Um, but, you know, I think it's important, I suppose, for artists to get involved in, in these kind of issues, and I am very interested as a sufferer of bipolar disorder in the issue of breaking uh, the stigma around mental illness and also breaking the confusion that exists which I think is quite dangerous and often goes unmissed certainly in my own country there's this um, misunderstanding that everyone who feels suicidal is suffering from a mental illness mm -hmm. and that's not always the case um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from I'm interested in the area of mental health stigma because I suffer myself from a mental illness and uh, I think it's important for us to get involved in that. And uh, yeah, it's important, as as Ray was saying there, to you know that we all actually start caring about each other. You know, because not caring about each other has, has led to this. But, you know. Yes, and not talking about it has got us here. Um, and I've seen you on Twitter talk about stigma killing people. Yeah. Could you say more about that for us? Well, I can only really speak about my own country. I can speak globally to a small extent, but I can only speak about in my own country there is a, a dreadful stigma around uh, the issue of mental health. And then there is also, as I said, this mistaken view that everyone who feels suicidal is suffering from a mental illness. In a society where crazy is a term of abuse, 
it's very frightening for people who believe themselves to be mentally ill because they are thinking suicidally to come out of the house and look for help. And also in my own country, and this is a really passionate bugbear of mine, the, because people believe you're mental, in virtue commas, if you feel suicidal, the only resources that people seem to believe are there are psychiatric services. Mm -hmm. Now it's very important that those of us with mental illnesses do access psychiatric services where suicide is a symptom of a mental illness. But for those who don't have a mental illness, there are these suicide prevention centres, but sadly, these places are not very uh, well publicised. So that the fear of stigma around mental illness, the fact that mad is bad, and I believe crazy should be ceased as a term of abuse in this world. But the fact that crazy is a term of abuse, of abuse and mad is bad means, and you know, there, you'll have to go to the psychiatric hospital if you feel suicidal. These things keep people locked in behind their front doors. So it should be, I think, broken down this idea that you are suffering from a mental illness if you are suicidal. Sometimes you are, in my case, that would be a symptom of something else. You do have to be responsible for that and rule out perhaps some type of chemical problem. Um, but I think there needs to be much more focus on suicide prevention centres because they are not associated as being, you know, you're, you have a mental illness if you walk in the door of one of these places. Also, they're free, they're quick, they change your thinking very, you know, within the second walk in the door. By, by the third visit, they start focusing on fun. You know, they don't just talk you out of killing yourself, they actually help you to rebuild your life, you know, to put the fun back in dysfunctional, which is really... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you know, it is really about laughter. It is really just this is about laughter to some extent. Now that sounds kind of you know stupid coming from me. Like you know, uh, people have other problems in life, financial or difficulties, and nobody can wave a magic wand and fix your financial problems. But there are people who can help you to do so. You know that kind of way. And uh, I found as a sufferer of mental illness, from which uh, suicidal feeling is, is a symptom if I'm not on medication. I spent perhaps, I'd say, 22 years running around psychiatry and hospitals and this and the other, and they're grand and all, but they were never a therapist or anyone specifically trained in the area of suicidal ideation. None of the psychiatric services that I came across in my own country, or in Britain for that matter, were specifically trained in that area. And again, this is why I'm, I always bang on and on and on about suicide prevention centres. These people are trained specifically in that area. They don't drive up your childhood. They don't want to talk about your mother, your father, your teddy bear, you know, all this stuff. You know, they they will deal with this thinking process that you have. And I found as a person who was feeling suicidal, the greatest help I got was suicide prevention prevention centres. And um, what they did was they helped me to take out the strands of the thinking. And I understood that really what, what was, that a lot of what was going on was A, tiredness, severe exhaustion. And a lot of people are thinking suicide, we are actually way more tired than they realize. So by visit number two, visit number one, they said to me, you don't want to sit in a room with the children of anybody who has killed himself, believe me. Now I knew that already, obviously, but you know, these people saying, these are people who have sat there with the children and people who have done this. When they sit with you, that changes your thinking immediately. Visit to um, the lady spoke to me about the off switch, which is often quite difficult for women. And I, I looked at her like she had 10 heads, what do you mean off switch? She said, you're always putting out your energy, it's always out, out, out. You know, why don't you just practice sitting and doing nothing? I thought she's mad, you know. And then I sat at home and I did it. And I, geez, I realized how tired I was. I had no idea how tired I was until I flipped the off switch. We must understand to separate the strands of thinking that an awful lot of it is exhausting. Um, then there's loneliness and all of these kind of things. And then there's, on um, by this tree, like I say, they start talking to you about fun. And to me, as, as a person who has felt suicidal and also suffers from a mental health, uh, a mental illness, uh, I found these prevention centres helped immediately, where I run around the world for 22 years trying to everything else. Now, look, if you have a mental illness, you must go to the other services as well, so don't be stupid. And I do not appreciate or buy into the anti-medication rubbish if for those of us who have mental illnesses. Do not listen to anyone who tells you that the medications do not work. It's like contraceptive pills, you know, different ones suit different people, but they work, absolutely. 
So anyway, blah, blah. That's where I'm going. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Sinead. Don't go. We'll just have a little whoop. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess it sounds like asking for help and getting help that works for you has been really uh, crucial for you and it sounds like you've had a really good experience of getting help from suicide prevention centres. I just wanted to say to anyone who's watching online that if you go to our website prevent-suicide.org.uk there are websites and helplines and there is help there for anyone who's thinking about killing themselves. So uh, you you for those people watching in Ireland you can contact PA to house there's also an organisation called SOS. Uh, if, you, if you Google uh, suicide prevention centres in Ireland, they'll come up very quickly, they're quick. The psychiatric services are very slow and not quick. Uh, these people are very quick, they'll see you immediately uh, and it won't cost you a jack. Thank you. And you've recently started an online petition to find out how many people in Ireland are thinking about suicide now. Could you tell us a bit more about why you wanted to do that and how it's going? Well, again, I revert back to the suicide prevention centres. When I came across them, I was staggered, as I said, that I had spent perhaps 22 years running around various psychiatric services and none of them had ever mentioned to me the existence of suicide prevention centres. So I was quite staggered uh, that I was only one of, you know, the four and a half million population of Ireland who doesn't actually know that these places exist. And unfortunately, these places are not government funded. They are charities because they treat people free, etc. And so uh, I think it's kind of dangerous that they're not really being publicised. And uh, I, I suppose I wanted to draw attention to that um, and really draw attention to the government that, you know, this is a very serious problem in Ireland and, and always has been. Uh, so what I did was we, we decided, I, I decided I wanted to try to get a head count, and it's a bit of a tall order, but what I was really trying to do was start a conversation. You know? uh, I probably need a bit of help with the whole thing, to be honest, I'm on the other day. I can barely send the link, but no, I don't know. Anyway, Twitter that I'm feeling suicidal 
someone uh, calls the police, that was issued of course, and the police come around to my house, and as it happens I wasn't in my house when I made this, this plea, but when I arrived home the police came, they were very nice, they came in plain clothes and so they wouldn't be great. And they said, look, is everything okay? And they said it was their duty to report to social services to make sure the kids were okay. So that was grand. Social services came around with, with a very threatening attitude of, you know, you've done something wrong by expressing this. That, and parents are falling through the cracks in Ireland because of this. There's a stigma within social services. The vibe was very much that I was a bad parent for having publicly expressed that I felt suicidal. And what they did was, it was quite threatening, the idea was that they were going to go off and check that the kids weren't traumatised by my feeling this way, and if they were, you know, they'd be in trouble. So then, interestingly, what happened, and this is telling the Irish, five weeks later, they write back and say that they're happy having spoken to the doctors with the schools and blah, 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 that the children are fine, that there's no worry, and basically, bye-bye, thanks very much. They didn't follow me up, okay? So... They came along to a suicidal parent who expressed they needed help. They had a bad vibe to that parent for doing that. They quite rightly checked the children were okay, although not responding for five weeks is a little worrying that the mm. children had not been okay, but that's mm. what's happened. Um, but they did not follow me up, and that's what's happening to parents in Ireland. So we were left with a suicidal feeling. So, okay, we're not going to top ourselves, but what help was that to my children? Had they been in difficulty? And what help is it to the children of a suicidal parent if social services have stigma? And also if they consider that the children being grand is all that matters, because the children remaining grand uh, involves supporting the suicidal parent. So in Ireland, there is no support for suicidal parent. Also for parents, uh, and I think they're the ones who are through the cracks most, to be honest. We don't want to be traumatised by having to go to hospital if we're ill. We don't want to leave the children. We want to be looked after in our own home. It shouldn't be... There is nothing in between being a bit depressed or wanting to kill yourself. There are no services. So if you want help, sometimes you don't have to pretend you're about to, you know, that kind of way. Um, so, uh, yeah, parents, I think, and blah, blah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sinead. We, we understand. Um, before we uh, kind of wind down the solo part of the interviews and move on to inviting you to talk to each other, do you have a message of support, Sinead, for our, the people here in Brighton and Hove and our efforts to make Brighton and Hove a suicide safer city? Yeah, you know, it, it really goes back to, you know, the, the entire globe is in, in spiritual crisis. All of these political and economic problems we see, in fact, they're spiritual crisis disguised as material crisis. Um, and the people who are suffering suicidal ideation are very sensitive people who perhaps are carrying the griefs really of all the world because they're kind enough in their souls to be doing so without even realising it. Um, it's very important to visualise those of you who are feeling suicidal, be aware that you're a very sensitive person and that we are all linked by this in the invisible cord that the Hindus speak of. So that if something terrible happens to someone across the world, those of us who are very sensitive might perhaps carry some of that without even realising it. A very important thing that I would advise anyone feeling suicidal to do is imagine yourself under, do this regularly, imagine yourself under a waterfall that washes away anything that doesn't belong to you, absolutely anything that doesn't belong to you. Another visualisation you can do to protect yourself from carrying other people's feelings because you're sensitive is imagine that you have manholes at the top of your head, here, 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 and here, and here, and every time you feel vulnerable or that you've been affected by somebody else's shit, frankly, excuse me, um, okay. close up these portholes so that nobody can get at you. And um, also understand that, you know, the I believe very much that, you know, souls come into the world in order to teach us lessons. And I think very vulnerable people are great masters, actually. We're showing us, as Ray was saying, these are teachers, you know. And, you know, so don't feel ashamed about feeling suicidal and certainly don't feel ashamed about saying so because what you're doing now realising is you're teaching us that we need to start caring about each other and you're, you're bringing to light a spiritual crisis. Um, now what you need to believe is that we are listening, the people are listening, beginning to get it, so that nobody needs to go as far as actually killing themselves in order to get looked after or in order to get you know, we will as a race very shortly shorter than you think come to the point where we have understood that we need to care about each other and that our problems are spiritual 
So, you know, be proud of yourself if you are a person who has a mental illness. Be proud of yourself if you're a person who has suffered a suicidal feeling or self-harm or any of these things. And, and celebrate yourself. And, and certainly, look, you are adored, even if you feel that you're not adored. And, you know, don't, don't uh, celebrate yourself by living as a student. For me, I'd like you to celebrate yourself by jumping around and sitting and being proud that you have the courage to be vulnerable. Thank you, Sinead. <laughs> We do hands up if you want to hear Sinead sing. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of people, Sinead. So, <laughs> um, we d- We'll all sleep like babies tonight, although they don't sleep very well, so maybe like logs. Um, so, thanks to um, amazing technical support from Abcom UK, we're going to allow the three of you to speak to each other, to ask any questions you would like to of each other. So, I don't really have a protocol for this. Maybe whoever has the loudest voice gets in first, or maybe. Roy, because it's been a while since we've heard from you, is there anything that you would like to say to Kate or Sinead or anything you would like to ask them? Can't you hear your microphone is off? Um, <laughs> ah. There we go. Well done, Sinead. I'm listening to and watching and feeling Thank you. That's an amazing endorsement of the work that's happening here. Um, Kate, is there anything you would like to say to Roy or Sinead or a question that you would like to ask? Uh, thanks to both of you. Um, Roy, your, your art brings in peace. It's, it's beautiful. And Sinead, my God, um, thank you for bringing up mental health. I live with borderline personality disorder, and I've only like come to terms with that over the past year. And I thank you for speaking up for that because it's been shaped, you know, and people say, "Oh, a borderline, oh my God, bad person." You know, you know try hard. Not if you try hard. And I want to thank you for being an example of trying hard. Okay, I'm very trying. 
and very hard, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> um, Sinead, is there anything you would like to say to Roy or Kate? Yeah, just it's been a great pleasure to meet the two of you. It's fantastic to, to say hello to you both. I, I'm, I'm delighted to have anything to do with, with this organisation or this, this night, rather. And uh, we'll have to get together for a smoke, myself and Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Electronically, kids. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring my phone. Another world exclusive. You heard it here first. Um, I, I would like to hand over to Miranda, who began Grassroots along with myself and two other friends, Jenny and Susie. She has a question. Okay, um, I do have a question, which is quite difficult. It's a big ask, but if you were going to say to us in one word, each of you, what would you leave us with in terms of instilling hope? for yourselves around your own experiences etc so what one word would you give us that means something to yourself because we're all here and we need to think about what instills hope in us and what keeps us safe and what keeps us going and we're just wanting to check out what that is for you Thank you, Miranda. So, again, if we could start with you, Roy, one word. And it's going to be your last word. Or two words, if that's <laughs> difficult. <laughs> oh, 200% inflation there. So. First word is spirit. The second word is love. And when it all comes down to one word, it's love. Thank you, Roy. Kate. I'm learning um, the activism of radical welcoming. So I'd say radical welcoming. Treat each other like with that eatering. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate. And Sinead? Music. Hey. Thank you very much, all of you. <laughs>